Hello everyone, welcome back to CDO IQ in Cambridge, Massachusetts. My name is Dave Vellante and I'm here with my co-host Sanjeev Mohan. Mario Faria is here, he's an adjunct professor at CMU, longtime CUBE alum, back to 2013. Mario, one of the, I think the very first CDO we ever interviewed on yeah, the CUBE. So congratulations to us for getting such a great guest and congratulations to you, an amazing career. It's so wonderful to see you again. Thank you so much, Dave Sanjeev. It's been a pleasure. I, I though, Although we have not talked since 2013, I'm a fan of your program. I always follow what you do in the conference and so on. Thank you for helping the data community uh, so much. Thank Dave. you so much for saying that. Now you are a veteran of this conference. Uh, you remember the early days. We started in 2013. You've been here for many, many years. Really started this, helped start the CDO trend, educate people on what it all meant. What's your journey been like? Share with the audience. Okay, so the first time that I was here was 2011, and we had 29 people on that conference. So 29 we could people? 29 people. <laughs> we could fit a room like <laughs> the one that we're, we are in right now. No sponsors, nothing, and we have moved so much because now we have 2,000 people attending this conference. So when we talk in 2013, I was with the Gates Foundation. After that, I right. joined Gartner, <coughs> uh, which I met. We were, we were we, colleagues. Yeah. We were colleagues at Gartner. Yeah. Uh, I spent one year at AWS, and now I'm a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon. I'm advisor of two companies. I help some people uh, on their careers to become CDOs, and that's now I will do some consulting job. What are you teaching at, at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon? Share us the curriculum. Uh, four years ago, Carnegie Mellon started a chief data officer program. I was invited to be part of that program, and I'm teaching uh, data products, data monetization, oh, wow. data strategy, and it's been an incredible journey, and we are just uh, releasing a new program that in the next month, instead of just being a chief data officer program, it's going to be chief data and AI officer program. You know what's interesting? So many questions come out of that, Sanjeev. But so, when you talk about data products and data monetization, the conversation you know, years ago when you started it was data quality, kind of a back office function. Now it's about making money, right? Yeah. <laughs> Driving productivity, I'm sure. You know, people are in certain, and then the other piece of that uh, that was interesting is we were talking earlier about CDO, chief uh, AI officer. Do those two roles come together? Of course it depends, but oftentimes they should. Uh, and so the fact that you're actually launching a curriculum around that is quite fascinating. Explain the rationale there. Yes, so we have to understand, we live through constant change. Okay, so this world is evolving. Uh, you mentioned the first chief data officers were just involved in the back offs, risk, data quality, and then they start doing analytics and digital transformation, and nowadays they're embracing AI. In a perfect world, yeah, we have just one executive responsible for data analytics and AI, and of course, uh, helping the transformation of, of companies. But the world is more complex than that. So in some organizations, we have one chief data officer, another chief AI officer, and then a CIO, and how those uh, individuals play together. Sometimes well, sometimes they do not. So what we try to teach in our program is about that, how ch the role should be, the res main responsibility is how the leaders should be putting a plan together that's driving companies on their mission to reduce costs or gain more money or improve productivity, and most important, uh, have a less risky approach to AI. Mm. Okay, um, I'm interested in your thoughts. We've been talking a lot about, uh, Sanjeev and I were kind of hmm. semi-debating. Uh, should an AI leader be a technical leader? Should yeah. that person you know, be somebody who's more curious? Um, how do you see it? Uh, you, you talk about the importance of building culture, but at the same time, AI is so new, you can fool a lot of people with magic, and you can and be- buzzwords. Be a, And buzzwords. Yeah. And buzzwords and be allured yeah. by that. So I appreciate your point of view. How do you see that balance between technical acumen and people skills, culture building, business skills? Is it a, is it a, a two, two tool star? How do you recommend organizations approach that decision? Yeah, being technical helps, but it's not <coughs> mandatory. The best uh, chief data officers and CIOs that I've met in my life, they do not have a technical background. They were able to understand, they were able to put together an organization with skills that would help the company to achieve their results. So, you talk about culture. 
culture more and more is a tremendous uh, lever, at the same time, obstacle for any data leader to achieve success. Data is abstract. We all agree about that. And when we talk about AI, it's even more abstract than that. So we're talking about the, all those tools available out there, all those algorithms and solutions out there. But the point is, what does it mean for a company to embrace that? What are the steps that they need to do? Is the company prepared to do everything? So culture is a tremendous uh, uh, topic that you have to bear in mind. This is one of the reasons that I'm here at this conference to deliver a session on the good, the bad, and the ugly of building a data culture. Okay? We mm -hmm. all know that's important. We all know what you need to do, but how to do it. That's what we're going to be exploring here in my session. Mm -hmm. See, this, this, this is very interesting because we were discussing <laughs> earlier about I was more leaning towards technical uh, capability because I come from this sort of hands-on practitioner side. So uh, data culture and all these soft topics to me are not... They're soft topics. They're soft topics, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's, it's like, you know, you, uh, the culture is like sort of built into the DNA of the leader. And it's not something that you just say, tomorrow I'm going to have this culture. You know, I, I don't know how people develop a new data culture. Mm -hmm. And what does it even mean, and mm -hmm. how do you sustain it? Yeah, so. the point is, it, the, uh, the data culture is quite intrinsic to the company's culture. Yes. So you cannot build a data culture unless you understand the current moment of the culture of your company. Mm -hmm. Are mm -hmm. the leaders prepared for a change? Do you need to uh, uh, do extensive program? How change management will take a, a role on that transformation? So, although it's soft, it can really bite you if you do not uh, take care of that, but because you're dealing with human beings. Y yes, and, and that's the most complex thing yes. in the world, is yes. dealing with people. But what, what we are saying is that if the CEO, or the chairman, or the highest level has the right culture mindset, they can push it down, but if a data leader comes in and says, you know, we need a cultural change, that's a very hard mm -hmm. to push it up and then push it back down to the rest of the organization. That's correct. Even if a CEO sometimes tries to push down, yeah. he or she might not be able to do that. Correct. Because uh, a lot of things are so intrinsic there, yes. uh, a lot of old behaviors. Yeah. And I like to say culture is what you do when yeah. the doors are closed yeah. and the light is off. Uh, okay, okay. This is an interesting <laughs> discussion because yeah. culture can just be an organic thing that emerges from an organization. And it is almost always, but it also can be something that comes from, you, you were at AWS. Those leadership principles, they take them very seriously. Yes. And you either embrace them or you shouldn't be at AWS. Hmm. Uh, my old company at IDG, they had, Pat McGovern had 10 things and he would sometimes quiz us on them. We would mm. used to think, oh, come on, soft, fuzzy yeah. stuff. But then it became like, like a decentralized organization. Mm. It was a mantra. Mm -hmm. And it actually became, so to your, po your point, is a question is a very good one. How do you maintain that? Mm. So yeah. I, 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 my sense is it either happens organically, like it does in our company, you guys know. We try to lead by example. We work really hard. We expect yes. everybody to work hard and grind. Humble. We text them on weekends. Yeah. And it's sort of, yeah. you know, yeah. it's not, not for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but others very, have very disciplined, well thought out sort of list of, of items that they, they, they make part of their ideology. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it's like, come on, I'm not going to buy this. It's very hard. Like a football coach yeah. has to get people to buy in or a soccer coach to buy into the to the message, a very tricky thing. I have, I have seen in my past leaders of my group or company come into a, to a meeting with a Harvard Business Journal <laughs> with like yellow sticky notes and you can tell they just read an article about culture <laughs> and now all of a sudden at the all hands they're like this is going to be our new culture. It doesn't work. Yeah, you know, yeah. that doesn't work. I, yeah. I, 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 totally and I like that about the principles that will guide uh, the changes. The principles will help the company to scale. So if you bring new people, if some people retire. So uh, the principles will allow you to uh, move with the culture to make sure that everything's ingrained with the people who work there. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to come back to the chief uh, AI officer. 
When should a company have a chief AI officer? When should it not? Give us a framework to think about that because I know I've talked to some CEOs. Um, I haven't talked directly to Chuck Robbins about this, but I've talked to people who work hmm. for Chuck Robbins at Cisco. They don't have a chief AI officer and, and, and it's not right for them. They've just burst over. But then a company like Dell, or Jeff Boudreaux, they put him in charge of you know, AI, AI. And so there's two different philosophies, both can work. When, how should we think about whether or not to have a chief AI officer, or should we always have a chief AI officer? Mm -hmm. or, or maybe that responsibility should be laid uh, upon the CDO or may even to the CIO. Um, after we had our conversation a few years after, uh, I, I've met one individual in a conference that came to me after my presentation, asked me, Mario, does my company need to hire a chief data officer? And I gave the consulting answer, well, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> so we talked a little bit, and after talking to that individual for 15 minutes, I, I told him, no, you don't need a chief data officer now because you're doing uh, that work. Maybe you need to empower your data organization uh, bring uh, people, but they should be reporting to you because you're doing the right things. So coming back to your question, Dave, should a company hire a chief AI officer? It depends. Uh, do, do, are they already doing the right things with data? Good uh, quality processes, good governance? Are they exploring analytics at scale? If so, maybe they're ready uh, to, to, to take the jump and appoint someone being responsible for AI. Maybe they're not doing the, the basic things so they should be doing a, a lot of groundwork, the foundation, that will allow them to explore AI further. And I, I personally think it makes, again, it's always that it depends, but to, to me, the chief data plus AI officer makes a lot of sense, and I would put governance as part of that, yep. and not part Compute. of data management. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that, to me, is very sensible, and it, you're right, it depends on the scale, mm -hmm. no doubt. I mean, there may be smaller organizations who need a dedicated technical leader in AI, to really go deep because they can drive you know, unique competitive advantage from building technology versus applying technology. But, but, uh, but I think that putting those together, because mm -hmm. I think Databricks with their conference name has that right. That the, the, true, they, yeah. they call it the Data, data Plus AI, AI Summit. Summit. You know, yeah. it's a, yeah. They've co-opted that. Right. And, uh, I, and you know what I find really, I'm, I'm actually smiling to myself because I heard you say uh, the answer is it depends and then you use it depends. And uh, something that you may not know, today is exactly the third anniversary since I left Gartner. Ah, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, on a great decision. <laughs> yes. And I created my podcast called It Depends. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's like John Ford on the one hand. Right? And one thing about AI, a message that I always like to tell the other chief data officers, the other data analytics leaders out there, please do not overcomplicate AI. Okay, AI is a technique with a lot of tools, it's great, it's revolutionizing, but AI is there to solve some uh, uh, problems that are uh, boring problems, I would say. Okay, so you're going to be solving problems with your call center, with your logistics, with your warehouse, mm -hmm. everything about uh, customer retention. So try to look at the boring problems that your company have. See how you can apply some AI techniques to help them out. Don't try to boil the ocean initially because you're not going to be able to do that, and you might uh, bring yourself to trouble. So maybe your company is not prepared for something fancy, but definitely for something that you can apply some uh, proof of concept, some uh, problem that's out there that nobody was ever able to fix that. Maybe with some AI algorithm, you're going to be able to do that. So but to that point, mm. uh, if you look at uh, IT spending right now, it's probably growing in three and a half percent. You know, not, not crazy. Back in the pandemic, it was six, seven percent, right? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was much higher. GDP is maybe, let's call it one and a half to two percent. When we look with our partner ETR, we do these surveys, uh, they show 40 plus percent of the customers are stealing budget from other places to fund AI. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing them push out now slightly the expectations for ROI. So they're, I like to say they're hitting singles, a baseball analogy. They're not hitting grand slams and home runs. Uh, they're getting little wins yes. on maybe productivity, a lot of experimentation going on, and there's a feels like there's a bit of a backlash now. All this hype, you look at NVIDIA stock, yeah. you think, oh wow, AI's mm -hmm. making everybody money. It's not, it's not throwing off enough cash to be self-funding now. So how do you see that with the organizations that you, you, you work with? Um, at what point does AI actually have to demonstrate monetization 
and be self-funding? Um, and what happens if it's not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you, fr 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 from uh, the initial point, from moment zero, you have to start uh, uh, putting something together that you can see a return on that. Mm -hmm. The majority of the companies out there, they're not NVIDIA, they're not Microsoft, they're not Amazon. They're real companies uh, with real problems. So when I was at Gartner, I uh, worked with a, a healthcare provider, and to implement a solution that use AI techniques to detect uh, skin cancer in, 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 in some exams that they were doing. It was not something that was replacing the doctors. It was not something that uh, it would work there without a doctor intervention. The, the, this AI algorithm will allow the doctor to really look for patterns that he or she might not be seeing at one point. So my recommendation, start for something that you, you can show the benefit right away because it will help you to increase your budget, to give you more power to do some fancy stuff. In the beginning, don't try to be fancy. Yeah. Go something that's very small, that you, you, your organization, your team, you all can learn from that experiment. And, and of course, when you ask people why are they not able to get into production, they cite legal, compliance, it's all those governance things. This yeah. is why I come back to maybe this, the chief data officer has to be exceedingly involved in that AI right. strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want to ask about uh, who does CDO report to these days, and I want to see if you have ETR data and if they are in sync. But, but just before we go there, I just want to say, you mentioned uh, uh, a few companies like NVIDIA and Apple, they're uh, raking in all the money there is. So in SAP 500 is setting a new record almost every day, you know? Yeah. Uh, now mm -hmm. it's over 5,500. But it's only those top seven companies, The if you look at S&P 493, they're not doing as well. Right. You Starting know? to broaden a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, but you're right. It's the Nvidia's, the Broadcoms, Microsoft, Google. Yeah. You know, all the Amazon. hyperscalers, yeah. uh, Meta, right. uh, Open, um, actually Open. It AI. feels like it's a virtuous circle where all the capex money is going to Nvidia, and then it's coming back yes. to the capex through mm -hmm. companies like Anthropic, where the Correct. investments are made, yeah. and yeah. it's yeah. a little bit like 1999 yeah. in that sense, yeah. because back then it was all advertising on portals right. like Yahoo yeah. and VC funding. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so, so there are some that similarities. Moment, 19, uh, the late 90s, all the companies and all the investment create an amazing uh, network infrastructure yeah. and data yes. center infrastructure, infrastructure throughout yeah. the world. It paid off over yeah. time. It paid off yeah. already. Yes. It took some time. Yeah. You might remember lots of companies that we had seen in, in the mid, late 90s, they just disappeared. Oh, yeah. Okay. Global so, Crossing, Enron, they were yeah. laying all well, this actually, fiber. My, my favorite is uh, one of the most spectacular failures of dot com boom was Webvan and WebVan's entire idea was to deliver groceries to your home. Mm -hmm. But there was, we, we didn't have the fast network, we didn't have the social, we didn't have mobile. Yeah, yeah. But today we have all that, yeah. and today we take it for granted. And you can make yes. a business So same thing's gonna happen to Gen AI. It's like, you know, some shine will come off, and then people will be like, oh, it, it, bust, it went bust, but uh, every single day there's tremendous amount of development going on in AI and it'll just keep getting better and better, and then f maybe five years down the road, it'll become the de facto way we do That's things. That's right, and, and, and Dave, you mentioned something about uh, risk and legal departments and so yeah. on, and with everything related to LLMs, and that you try to, you need to feed data in order for LLMs to, to work, okay? And what happens if you release your data by mistake to another place they're going to be using your data where you don't have permission yeah. to do that. What will happen to multinational corporations where the yeah. data is stored in some places in Europe that you cannot export and all of a sudden your model starts to work in here in the United States. So th uh, th uh, we'll see that new problems that we have never thought about will start to appear. Hmm. So I, I believe that we're going to be going through a tremendous moment, new jobs yeah. that uh, we even think about that the last five years are going to pop up, hmm. but at the same time, AI will bring uh, the, uh, more productivity that will allow some of the jobs out there to, to disappear. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be taken like yeah. overnight, right. but it will happen. All right, so we got to leave it there. Uh, you know, I just want to uh, close the yeah. loop on the CDO. Who does the CDO these, like, is it business CEO? Like, what, what are you seeing? Who's a CDO reporting to? Uh, the majority I would say for the large companies, yeah. uh, CDO uh, has a large propensity to be working for a CIO. 
CI. Uh, yes, for, for the large companies. But when you go to, to a smaller company, okay. sometimes to a marketing operation, to the yeah. CEO, yeah. okay, so uh, it, it, it really okay. depends. So again, it depends is, is, is the answer. <laughs> is that the same? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have the ETR data on that. No, I don't know. It's all lumped together at C-suite. Right. They just added that, but, uh, but that's a good Okay. A good question to find out. Guys, thanks so much. Thank you. Mario, pleasure thanks having you. you. Thank you. It's so nice to see you uh, again. Likewise. For Sanjeev Mohan, Dave Vellante, we're here at CDOIQ 2024 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Keep it right there.